Hey kids, Mr. Fly here, hope you're well. Time for another video interview in my occasional video interview series. This time it's with an engineering nut and a bike mad genius. Pretty good combination. Uh, none other than Alan Milliard. So grab yourself a brew and uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy this chat with Alan Milliard. Well, I think you'd be more Q, wouldn't you? Or would it be M? Who's the gadget man? M, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he's the fella. <laughs> so, uh, Questions then. First off, I'm going with what I call my chef's prerogative question, uh, which is basically right. a question from me. So like, if you're cooking, you get to try the food, don't you? So uh, I yeah. wondered, out of all the projects you've done, which have been prolific, which have you found the most challenging to date and why? It's really, really difficult to say because they're all challenging. Yep. As I wouldn't do it. Every single bike I've made had a different problem that I've had to overcome. Right, say, for instance, the Viper, how do you hold an 800 pound weight engine that engine that weighs 800 pounds it's got 500 brake horsepower make it work in a motorcycle yeah and then yes it's, from, yes it's from 100 how do you put a v-twin in a spine frame bike without losing all the strength and they've all got every single bike i've made has got its different problems because i try and make them look as original as possible like the Velocet v-twin you, you can't compromise on the looks it's got to be right yeah exactly exactly so um so there's not one that sticks in the mind that was an absolute bugger that you gave up on and thought sod that i'll just bin that for i've never day. given up i've never ever given up but i, I will say the kawasaki v12 this is a bit of a story actually i finished okay. the whole bike it was totally finished the indicators flashed the lights worked took it to snap a show in 2000 i think it was i won best in show with the bike when they said could be here at run i said i'm sorry but it's got no comrades in it at the moment i don't i, can't, I don't know how to work that out and make the crankshaft <laughs> And I got a lot of bad press about that back at the time. Anyway, the yeah. following year, I did a burnout with the bike and put the fire alarms out, so I was okay. But when <laughs> I made the bike, I didn't know how to make the crankshaft, but I didn't know that bothered me. I just carried on. I love just that. Park that problem. Just park the problem, get on with something else, and then come back to it later. I love the fact that you embark on these projects without actually knowing how they're going to end. You don't have a solution, don't. you just crack on. She, I usually get inspired. I like get a show, someone will say, oh, that's impossible to do. That's how I made the V12 and the V8s. Yeah, I say, oh, and and you judge. I need to be inspired or challenged. Brilliant. To do it. Any anything is possible. You can make anything, any motorbike, any configuration. Put any engine out of any bike into any other bike. Make V eight, V twelve, straight six, straight eight fire blade if you want. It's not impossible. Yeah, it can be done. That's how. But I've got, I've got, but I've got to be able to want to do it. Otherwise, yeah. I won't do it. It won't happen. So what are the ones that particularly pique your interest in? What is it about? What, you know, what makes you want to make a, you know, a V10 Viper as opposed to a straight eight Fireblade? But the fact the Viper was my son, Stephen, back in whenever it was, 2008, I think it was. No, 2004. Good Festival Speed. And they had a uh, Dodge Tomahawk there, which is the, the Chrysler version of what I did. And it wobbled along at 40 mile an hour with its four wheels. And the guy, and I think they crashed it into some hay bales. <laughs> and Stephen said, Dad, you can make one better than that. I said, yeah. oh, I said, where are we going to get a Viper engine? And we went straight on the, on the internet at the time, which is the old dial-up. Like and he goes, there's one there for, for I think it was about 5,000 quid at the time. He goes, wow. just buy that. And I looked in my bank and I thought, oh, I can just about afford it. And pushed to put in a bid and I won it, didn't I? Wow. <laughs> so, so that was it. It sat, it sat in my garage for three or four years. I, couldn't, I, I had no money left to do anything with it. But I had this Viper engine. And, and quite a few times I thought, this isn't going to happen. I'm just going to put this in a car or something. But I thought, no, I've got to make it happen. Even if I can never be able to ride it, I'm going to make it happen. And I did, and I finished the project. And, it, and it, I've done over 10,000 miles on it and ridden it over 200 miles an hour several times. So start to, start to finish then. How long did it take to, to build that, the bike that, once you decided you were going to go ahead with it? That, that took from 2007 to 2010 right, okay. to make. But it was yeah. mainly due to the money. I couldn't buy the parts I needed quick enough. Right. So I had to park it. I, I in that period, I made four downhill mountain bikes. Bikes, as you do other projects because the viper project everything was so expensive I, i'd save up and buy one part and get like the computer to run it was three thousand five hundred pounds right just the computer to run the engine i needed to get that early on so i could mount it and do the wiring and get it all configured yeah and everything everything was really expensive and the tires and the wheels the chains the chain it's chains are 300 pounds getting on for a special drag race chain crikey so I, I can't you know you couldn't just go out and buy everything you wanted so it, so it took three years well and pre presumably that's um also with that not only i mean you've got the financial issue but actually the physical issue of moving it around at the garage being so large and heavy it's quite heavy i jacked it up with a trolley jack onto some blocks of wood and then, yeah. I, then I made a steel framework to mount it nice and tight when i was actually making it and i actually got the engine at ride height and built the bike all, all around the end like i explained in the last video i did with you yeah the engine and it never moved until i dropped it down onto its wheels for the first <laughs> time and pushed it around 
but it's, it is a very, very, very heavy bike. But the second you're moving, the second you're doing half a mile an hour, it's do docile and easy to ride, it's except on gravel. You, you never ride it on gravel, like deep gravel or mud. I was going to say, I slippery to, grass wouldn't be good. But in the Isle of Man, I had ridden it across a field in the rain, and that oh. was unbelievable fun. It was, ah. it, was, it was, let's try not to do a wheel spin if we can, you know. It was on, because 550 pounds foot of torque. That must have been it's very scary. BHP at idle. You know, 100 bhp at idle. So it was very hard to, to meet to the clutch to I get a wheel spin. I can't even ride my GS across a muddy field, and they're designed for that sort of thing. Yeah, that was a <laughs> cronker body straight, it was. TT 2012, if anyone was there, proper wet. Yeah, I'll I, bet. Was, I, I remember riding over the mountain, and you couldn't see, you couldn't see your front mud guard. <laughs> <laughs> That's you the length of the bike again. Brilliant. Anyway, that was, that was my question, so I hogged the line lot there. Okay, so first, uh, first proper question then from uh, Alan Black, another Alan. Uh, he says, hi Andy, uh, thanks for the opportunity to watch your videos on YouTube and participate in popping a question to Alan Milliard. My question is, has Alan thought of making a flat tanker bike from 100 years ago with spring or front end as if Alan was living in that period? I'm not sure what he means by the last bit of that, but a flat well, tanker type bike. I sort of have, that's the Flying Milliard. It's a 1920 flat tanker with girder forks on the front, which are like springers. And yeah. it's, that, is, that, that was inspired as if I was around in the, what would I do if, if I was around in the twenties? I'd get a couple of old airplane cylinders and make that bike. So, so yes, I have. And I, and I actually want to make a smaller version of it, maybe about three litre. Fantastic. Which sometime in the, I've got the cylinders already off of a British radial engine. And, and it came, the, the cylinders are 1800 cc's each. So that'd be quite nice. Cause this one's two and a half a pot. Yeah. So I can oh, make, I can make a slightly that. smaller version of it, but that's sort of a back burner job really. I'll, I'll, I'll do it one day. That sounds right up my street. Anything with aeroplanes involved, then I'm up for that. So, uh, yeah, well, actually, when uh, Alan sent in that question, I did think, does the flying milliard count in this? Because, but he specifically said flat tanker, whereas that's got a slightly bent tank. If no, I'm it's, flat. Right. it's flat. Is it completely the flat? Whole, the whole top is flat. It's one sheet of two millimetre stainless. It's completely right. flat. I stand corrected. Excellent. Well, thank you, uh, Alan Black, for the question. Next one uh, from Patrick. Uh, does Alan have a dream build? in that genius brain of his that he hasn't been able to get off the ground for whatever reason. No worries, he doesn't want to let that particular cat out of the bag. Dream build. Well, I, ha I, I haven't, because I, I, I might wake up tomorrow with the idea. I, I never hanker over doing anything, because I've done pr some pretty cool bikes in my time, and everyone's as good as the one before, but I, I don't, I don't, I'm not one of those people that wishes for something. I, I, I wish I could do this, I wish I could make this. Wish I, if something comes along, so I'll, I'll see something, read something, hear something, or pick up something sometimes in order. Oh, look at this bit here! I can make something with that. Yeah, and the whole bike will evolve. You know, fantastic. So, so, so I don't really. So, I haven't really got a desire to make any particular bike. It's it's quite a. I get asked this quite a lot actually. It's not an uncommon question. I bet. Yeah. But, but I haven't got that desire to go and make something because because I'd be if I had that desire to make it, I'd be doing it now. Well, exactly. I assume every bike you've made was your dream bike at that time. It was. I mean, I, got, I was out on the SS100 this afternoon. It is idyllic to ride. It does. 50 yeah. mile an hour, it's beautiful to ride. Fabulous. And tomorrow this... I'm going to be riding my Super 6, doing some tuning on the engine on that tomorrow. Lovely. And, and, and that's lovely to ride. Whichever bike I'm on on the day is my favourite bike. Yeah, I agree. And then this great weather we've been having as well. It's been a bit cruel, actually, when we couldn't ride, wasn't it? Have it you been was. out? Least I can't... Since, we, um, since the lockdown eased slightly, as of, I think it was last, when... was it last Wednesday or the one before when we started to be allowed to ride? Have you, have yeah. you been doing a lot of riding? No, not a lot, but I was out on the two strokes yesterday. We're doing a bit of video in 1004 and my son's 666 that I made him for his birthday four years ago. Great. And we, well, so I, I, I met him up for a bit of social distancing, just one person, like yeah, you're allowed right. to do. Yeah, so we, we met up at, at one of the local villages and we just rode around and did some videoing and then came home. And I've been, I've been out on the Pan European, which is my daily sort of work hack. And the little bikes, the SS180, the SS100. And I'll be, I'm going to be out on the Super 6 tomorrow. Sounds like you've been out a fair amount then. Brilliant. And this weather's been so cracking. It's been just a joy to be back out on the bike because I didn't realise quite how much I missed it. I went for two months without riding, the longest I've ever been. And, uh, and me too. We actually, my friend rang me. He said, do you realise this is the longest we've not ridden for 40 years? Yeah. And I said, no, right. Simon, longer than that for me because I used to ride every day from when I was 10. Yeah. 10 wow. or 11 years. I rode every single day. So it's, so it's, a, long, it's a long time. Yeah, it's a f funny old thing, isn't it? How that sort of gets in you. It's a bit like I've got a bit of an addiction to curries as well. It's a bit like I miss curries and uh, going out on my bike and flying, to be fair, which I'm hoping to put right this week. But that's a, it's a similar sort of thing. But uh, yeah. you need to keep practice for those sort of things as well. I mean, you, you do lose keep your current. Because I, I did notice when I jumped on the pan and I went over to see Henry. So I hadn't ridden a bike for four or five weeks. 
you, I was coming into bends a lot quicker than I should, felt happy. Exactly. Whereas normally I fly around these bends normally on, in the Cotswolds. So I end up riding a lot slower because I just felt my reactions weren't as good as they should have been. Exactly right. But, it is that keeping current and keeping your skills right. Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, you don't but forget, it all came but, back. But, it all yeah, came you, back. So within a couple of days, it's, I'm back to normal now. Exactly. But you're definitely a bit rusty to start with. And uh, I find that yeah. on the bike and the plane, uh, it's a bit more serious yeah. than the plane, perhaps. I don't know. Maybe it's serious on both, really. But um, yeah. you, know, you don't want to forget something key. Uh, but yeah, I noticed exactly the I same. I put your undercarriage down, yeah. Well, exactly. Under Actually, that's yeah. why I fly a fixed undercarriage plane because there, there's two types of pilot: those that have landed with the wheels up, and those that are going to. Apparently, right. <laughs> anyway, next question. <laughs> this one comes from somebody called Adrian. Thank you for the question, Adrian. Uh, has Alan ever had a project that hasn't delivered on what he expected? Something that didn't meet his vision for when it he went for when he started. I think I probably know the answer to this. Go for it. No, not not at all. It's, I say I, I always I try and think things through all the time continuously at the beginning of a project so i know exactly what i'm going to do and how it's going to turn out but sometimes like with the v12 i know there's going to be key areas where i can't physically do at this stage so mm -hmm. i just wash over that Karen will do everything you can that you know you can do and then when you get to the, the end of it you can do the stuff you can't do if that makes sense yeah yeah absolutely yeah 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 excellent and the viper the, the viper had issues with transmission and all sorts of issues but i didn't i don't sit there for hours pondering on that problem i just park it get on with what i can do yeah and then then it, it all gels in the end. You know, I've never had, never had any projects that haven't finished and worked. You're a lucky Ever. man. Brilliant. Okay. I suspected that would probably be your answer. All right. Next one from uh, Richard Higgett uh, or Bandit Man UK, his channel's called, a, a prolific questioner. Uh, he says, uh, which of your creations do you enjoy? I probably can guess the answer to this as well. Which of your creations do you enjoy riding the most? In fact, there's a few questions here, so we'll take them one at a time. So yeah. that's the first one. Which one do you like riding most? Well, it's, it's the one I'm on on the day. Yeah, we've already covered it, I, that. It's really, really funny because I've got half a dozen bikes that I ride regularly. And whichever one I'm riding on the day is, is my favourite bike because they've all got massive character. They're yeah. all completely and totally different. And they've all got amazing... Like when I'm on the Viper, it's, it just makes you laugh. You just can't stop laughing because this yeah. thing is so big and so powerful. When it's ripping your arms off and then compressing you, the front brake is so violent because it's so heavy, you can get so much G-force into the braking. Your and arms... You've got to worry about going on the back of it. Your arm, no, only if I want to. I can do it Joe style as well. But then when you're out on the F of Flying Milliard, it's just a laugh. Everyone's laughing at you and pointing at you going down the street. Yeah, fabulous. And then the two strokes, they just want... The two strokes just want to be thrashed. And the, by 500 LC, you can't... It's really hard to ride it at legal speeds. Yeah. You, you have to, but I do try to. It's, but next thing you know, you're going a lot faster than you want to, and you're braking all the time. So every bike I ride on, whichever day it is, is my, is, is my favourite bike for that day. I can relate to, I can relate to that. I love all bikes, and basically, yeah, as long as you're on a bike, who cares? It doesn't matter what it is. And exactly. So next question from Richard Higgett. Uh, I believe Guy Martin challenged Alan to build his Honda 6 after a conversation saying how expensive the original was. Um, question. Has anyone else inspired or challenged him to build a bike or is he just very self-motivated? Are you very self-motivated? No, I, I, do get, I do get a lot of people saying, make this, make that, make, but I've got to want to do it myself. Yeah. And I, and I, was, talk, I was chatting with Guy Martin at Castle Coombe. I went up on my Viper bike and I managed yeah. to get onto the start straight with him. Right. And what happened? And uh, we, I, I was chatting to him and he was going out on George Bill 6. And I said, that's oh, an amazing right. bike. I said, there's no way I could ever afford one of those. Like, they're like £400,000, aren't they? Yeah, and he, and he just looked at me and said, "Make one," and I thought, "Yeah, yeah, I will." So literally on the way home, I was planning it in my mind all the way home from Castle Coombe, which is about an hour and a half on my plan. Yeah. By the time I got home, I'd worked out how I was going to make the engine, what engines I wanted to buy, and where to get them from. So wow. the next day, I was I was straight on the phone at nine o'clock in the morning to DK Motorcycles and got a couple of Yamaha SLR 250RR engines. They arrived on Wednesday, and by Friday they, they were already cut up. Wow. You know, you know, the project came together quite. I think I had the engine running in six weeks. Was, Did you it offer great. it to Guy Martin as a flock to sell for 200 grand? No, not yet. I, I, actually, I, I actually honestly say I haven't had much chance to ride it much yet because the, one, the weather was really, really bad. Every time I got a chance to ride it, I went to, to Prescott Hill Climb, it absolutely thunder and lightning poured down. I got one run up the hill. Yep. Then it was so loud, I got banned from running it anymore. Ah, that's outrageous. What like 130 thinking? decibels through the speed thing. And then there's a limit of 106, I think. So. Uh, no chance on but, track days then. Uh, no, so, so, so no, so I don't, I don't, I don't, I do get inspired by lots of people. I, yeah. I can't remember all the names now of all the bikes. Like the V8, I was inspired by somebody at a show. The V12, someone shouted out and say, actually, I was, I was getting my prize for the V8 at Stafford. And this chap said, that's impossible to make a V12 out of this F13 because I've got one. I know, I know it inside out. Yeah. I said, oh, well, is that a challenge then? And then somebody else gave me two engines. Oh, well, that's got to be done he's, then. 
he was a breaker and like a dealer. And he goes, I've got a couple of old wrecked engines in my shed. You can come and get them now if you want to on the way home. Right. So I did. I went and picked them up and that was my start for the V12 project. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a challenge that's got to be done then in that case. Isn't it? So is it true that, so it was a Guy Martin challenge that sort of inspired the Honda 6? It was, it was. That, was. that is all true. Brilliant. Excellent yeah. story. And then the last one from Richard Higgett, um, which I think we've covered, uh, is Alan doing any more TV with Henry Cole already recorded after lockdown? So, yes. Yeah, well, that's all starting 1st of June, so I believe. So, Great. find it, fix it, vlog it. Find it, fix yep. it, vlog it in the motorbike show I'll get involved with. Excellent. Uh, okay, next one, Neil Rankin. Hi, Alan. Uh, I've been enjoying your videos. You always make it sound so easy when it seems impossible to me. Uh, question one. Uh, the two bicycles you made are brilliant. Ever thought of adding an electric motor? Not really my thing. I, I wouldn't, I didn't hear it, I would never say never, but it's not really my thing. I'm sort of petrol, even diesel, but petrol really, petrol engines really, or, or just bare, bare legs. Have you ever done that with a wankle engine? No, I don't like rotary engines. It I doesn't, does nothing for me. Like the Suzuki RE5 and the DKWs and the Norton rotaries. Yeah. They're basically two strokes. They're dead two strokes, but they don't do really do it for me, really. Fair enough. Fair but enough. I wouldn't say no on the electric front. I wouldn't say no, but it's unlikely. Yeah, it's a whole other game, that, isn't it? But uh, yeah. All right, next one from Neil. Uh, question two. You've converted a number of singles into V-twins. I can't get into my head how you sort out the crankshaft, manage to fit it all in the crankcase and balance it. So it doesn't vibrate to bits. Can you explain that a bit? Good luck with this one. Well, the crankshaft, if, I, if we say the SS50 engine, the little one I normally do, yep. the crankshaft's got two discs with a crank pin with one connection rod. So I press that apart, make a longer connecting uh, crank pin, as the, long as the width of one connection rod longer. So then you can put two connection rods on. Then to balance it, you've got to remove metal because you're adding weight of a connection rod. So you've got to remove metal of that equivalent weight from the crankshaft. Right. So I just, if you watch my video I did, I just take it out of the garden with an angle grinder and just grind away metal. And I just hold it in my hands and feel it. And I can feel where the balance is, whether it's right or wrong. Crikey. And, 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 and literally, is that the end of the balancing, just by feel? Or do you then actually yeah. weigh them and wow. I, do, I do actually, I, I do. I, the thing is, I've done so many of them now, so I don't need to weigh them anymore. I can just do it by feel. But the very first one I did, if you weigh the piston, you weigh your connection, well, that's reciprocating weight. <clears throat> and you've got rotating weight and then you do a little calculation you can get you can download them offline the calculations yep. and i'll tell you what weight you've got to add to your bare crank pin to spin it on some knife edges so i did that with the very first um, ss100 years ago 1999 i did that and since then i know exactly where to cut now i just get the angle grind out just grind that's, it out. It, that's incredible i mean i did watch that video it's fascinating watching you do that and i just thought that if i got an angle grinder i mean it would just the chance well, of his, grinding too much off, off. Here's the crankshaft in the video. I That's made this for the video. I've got, I haven't got a bike for it to go in. Right. I made that crankshaft for the video, just That's to show cool. how it's done. It's all made out of old parts, but it, it's actually a good serviceable crankshaft. It could, it could run in an engine. It's good enough to run it in Looks like engine. a piece of art for me for the sideboard. Okay. Yeah, Particularly so my sideboard, that would look good on. <laughs> see, normally, normally it's, compl it's completely round, see, normally. So yeah. just cut that out. Then the but now you've got to put that back in the crankcases that aren't wide enough. So you have to cut the crankcases and make them wider and weld metal in. But then yep. you've got to move all your cylinders back to where they used to be. Oh. So where all the cylinder studs are and all the, where the barrel goes onto the crankcases, you've got to move that back. So you have to weld loads of metal in and remachine it all and drill, re-tap re threads. But oh, the gearbox has got to remain the same width. So you only cut the front of the crankcases. Wow, incredible. Have you ever um, taken too much off? You can weld it back on if you do. Well, I suppose, yeah. Good answer. Yeah. Why not? Well, Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Neil, for those questions. Uh, next one from Phil Collins. I don't know if it's that Phil Collins. I suspect not. Um, but uh, if it is, love all his albums. Uh, I'd like to know where he learned engineering. You, not Phil Collins. <laughs> Did he train as a mechanical engineer or is he self-taught? Well, it started from when I was about 10. I, I was always, always, as far as I can remember back even to right five or six when you had Lego, I was always interested in engineering, thing, taking things apart. My dad was a design engineer. For British right. Hoist and Crane, he made cranes. So I was always helping him. This is back in the days with slide rules and cardboard cutouts and yep. gluing things together and twisting. And I was always interested in strain and twisting and strength of materials. So yep. I got into it. Then when I was sort of 11, 12, I bought, got lawn mowers, Atco lawn mowers, rally runabout. So I put a lawn mower engine and a motorbike when I was like 12. And then that got, then I went into metalwork at school. I went to do metalwork lessons, which I would do all that. And obviously I got an apprenticeship with the Ministry of Defence, and I learned all my proper engineering skills there. And I turned out as an instrument maker where you make clocks and things, clock mechanisms, yep. to you know, find small stuff, which I really enjoy doing. So I, got, I, got, I had a broad spectrum of training, but I learned a lot myself as well, and obviously my dad taught me a load of things. You know, he, never, he never 
stop me doing stuff. They always let me learn myself, which is a good thing. I'm, I'm, was, I'm, I'm, I'd say, can I do this, Dad? He'd say, yeah. He probably full well knew that it wasn't going to work. But he said, yeah, have a go. And, and you learn a lot of things at an early age, what you can and can't do. Can you imagine a 12-year-old now putting a, a lawnmower engine in a bike? It just doesn't happen, does it, these days? No. Or a 15-year-old put an 850 mini engine into a BSA when I was 15. Yeah. Yeah, nuts. And I rode it up to school and across, across the common in the grass and got caught by the police and all that. Like Fantastic. I explained before, you know. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. I love that story. Brilliant. Yeah, all right. All thank, thank you, Phil, for that question. Next one from Debenham Dave. I don't think he works at Debenham's. I think he lives at Debenham, which I think is in Suffolk, if I remember rightly. Um, hi, TMF. Could you ask Alan of his proudest engineering achievements? Good That's question. another difficult one, isn't it? Because mm. every bike I make, when I'm making it, my, is my proudest achievement. Like, the Super 6, I, 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 that was, I was actually, I'll tell you the story, I was actually at Henry's filming with Henry. And, I, and we, we were shutting off for Christmas and he, and he said, what are you going to do over Christmas? I said, oh, I'll make a, bike, make a bike engine or something. And I'd just done some work on his head, said 900 at his. And I just glibly said, I'll make a six-cylinder Z1. Yep. And everyone sort of looked at me and smiled and we all went off for Christmas. And that's, on the 17th of December, I started making a six, uh, six-cylinder Z1. And by early February, it's running on the test bed. Wow. Fantastic. I had no previous thought, no planning, no nothing. I just thought, I'm going to, I am know how they were. I'm, I'm very familiar with the Z engine. Yep. I thought, I'll just get that engine, I'll just cut it apart, make the crankshaft longer, cut yep. and weld, a bit of filing and welding and make it look good. And that was the first Z1. And it started up on the kickstart. On, it fired on its second kick and ran on the third. Incredible. On the kickstart. Great stuff. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dave, for the question. Uh, another David, David Todd. Um, in normal circumstances... How often do you meet up with Henry, Guy and Sam? It depends what we're doing. I, I do tend to do three days a week. That's what I like doing three days a week. But if we're really tight on schedules, I'll go in four or five days. But t typically, if I like, find it, fix it, flog it, it's, it's three days a week for four or five months. Right. It's quite you know, it's a lot of time, shows. It? Yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty much it's a lot of stuff to do. There's eight, there's eight things to do. You've got to get all the things restored, get them working and then film them and then get them out on the show. Yeah, yeah. It's great fun. We have we have such a laugh though, a real proper laugh. Some of the stuff is pretty grim, and I, and I have to look excited and go, yeah, that's lovely. We can sort that out. Yeah, yeah, a bit, yeah, bit yeah. of sanding, a bit of buffing, you know. But if you're having a laugh, that makes it not seem like work, doesn't it? So that's yeah, it's, when, when we have something great, like a Peta engine or a dump truck or the Z1 H1 500s we had rally yeah. runabouts, Huck yeah. Maxes. It's all worth it for those, you know. Yeah, fantastic. But when it's when it's when it's a coffin carrier. Yeah, and not so much. Like that. or an old table or something. You've got to look excited about it and make it work. Yeah, it's quite but, hard to look excited about a table, isn't it? But uh, there you go. Good it's, stuff. It's such a laugh because we're all we're all mega petrol heads, and, it, and it's it's yeah, well, it's, it shines it's through. That's what I think makes it such a you know compelling viewing, doesn't it? I, I love it. So I was gutted when the um, the current motorbike show was delayed because I think I've got a feeling in episode one of the new series actually Henry goes out to see my mates in um, Grand Canaria. So I was looking forward to seeing. I think that. he does. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. Does. So I was really yeah. looking forward to that. So uh, just give them it's a shout a nice out for Canary Motorcycle it's Tours. It's great riding. It's a nice, nice riding in Mallorca and that as well. I think he's done all those Grand Canaria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's lovely. Well, Spain generally is lovely, isn't it? But uh, there we go. That would be a whirlwind well we'll riding right. there again. Difficult. Sadly. Right, next one from Colin Vincent. Um, have any of your builds ended as your original idea envisaged, or is it always fluid, and are any 100% finished in your head, or are they always a work in progress for when time or inspiration permit? Hopefully. No, no, everything gets, I, I, once I get on it, I'm like a bull in a china shop, I want to get the thing done, with the exception of the Viper bike that I had to wait for financial reasons. Yep. Everything else is done in rapid time. I mean, the RC3 sample was 12 weeks. That's and amazing. I had to make everything, the frame, the fairing, from a model book, just literally me measuring off of a model book Brilliant. and making all these parts. And I, I, the first time I made an aluminium fairing was for that bike, and I did it right first time. I've never right. made a frame before. It was a proper big a, a replica frame that's exactly the same millimetre for millimetre. So, so, yeah, so there are things you can bend on, but I, I have an idea of what I want to make. Because I, I make all my bikes usually to be factory prototype. They look like factory bikes. So yep. you know what it's going to look like when it's finished. You just got to make it happen. Yeah. I'm, I'm, these custom guys that make these one-off wacky design things that they don't themselves. That that's a complete one-off thing. You can be fluid on it. You can change the design halfway through. You can add bits here, take bits off. But I can't really do that. I mean, Kawasaki Z1 has got to look like a Kawasaki Z1. Yeah, of course. And from the side on, straight side on, I can't tell the difference. There's nothing on it that makes you tell the difference from the side. That's great. And, that's, and that's what I was aiming to achieve. You see. 
Oh, I didn't realise that's what you were aiming for. I mean, I realised you were trying to make them look factory, but I hadn't thought about the, you know, the side view would be exactly the same, but of course it would. All my bikes, the, the H2s, the four cylinders, the five cylinders, you look them straight from the side, apart yep. from obviously the two trucks have got expansion chambers, but everyone fitted those anyway. Yep. They look totally standard. Brilliant. And what the ones that are, like the, the SS100 V twins, they are one-offs, but they're all exactly the same. I've made four of them identical. Yep. Brilliant. Well, that's just but, what I like doing, making things that are factory prototypes, really, rather than specials. Looks good to me. Uh, so thank you, Colin, for that question. Next one from Faraz. Um, well, this is quite a question to get your head around. Should have given you advance warning this. What, in your view, is the biggest engineering feat humankind has achieved to date? And what do you think is an area we still have yet to really achieve in the near future that we are behind the curve on? Of course, both these should be in motorbiking terms, which makes it a bit more tricky. Motorbiking, that's a difficult question to answer really, isn't it? Yeah. Is he referring about... just to motorbike challenges or is it like Space Station, for instance? Well, that's, that's what I was going to say. I mean, let's widen it out then because it is difficult. We'll maybe come back to motorbikes when we thought about it. But what's the biggest engineering feat humankind has achieved to date? Space Station. I, 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 I would say it's got to be like, the line, in my opinion, something like the Space Station. It's got to be. I mean, think yeah. about getting all that stuff up there and then you've got to put it together and you, it's travelling at 17,000 miles an hour and there's micrometeorites and all this stuff. And, I 100% agree. I mean, that is amazing. And the, the thought of it going out of service, I think it's got a you know, finite life, isn't it? It's not that much longer, is it? It's only like... It sinks. Next... It's, it's always sinking down, isn't it? So yeah, and they have to thrust it back up again. Exactly. It's amazing. I, yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated by space, I have to say. And, um, and that it would be my answer to the next one, where it says, um, you know, what are we behind the curve on? I've always been very disappointed. As somebody that was born in 1968, I don't remember man landing on the moon. And I personally think that by now, I'd sort of hope we'd at least made it to Mars. So I'm, it's I'm too, very disappointed It's too about hostile, that. isn't it? It's such a hostile environment. Yeah, and I it's guess you've got to be prepared to not come back. So that's a bit of a tricky project. If it takes you 20 years to get there or whatever it is, you're going to be half your yeah, life gone. It takes you back. two years to get there, isn't it? It's the coming back. Two years, that's it. Yeah. yeah, but nonetheless, yeah. that's a fair old, you know, we've moaned about lockdown for two months and I've seen my wife. That's going to be tricky, <laughs> mind you. <laughs> the, uh, the Mars thing suddenly becomes more attractive. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, so what do you think we're behind the curve on? That was my answer to that question. Have you, have you got an answer to that one? Uh, I, I, I remember years ago, Honda saying that they had some special techno engine technology that they, were, they couldn't release. This is back in the 70s, right. where like a 100 cc engine, like 100 horsepower. Wow. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. I'm, uh, petrol engines are about 30% efficient, aren't they? Right, I don't know. So you, you, yeah, 30%. The rest goes out in heat. heat. Right. So if, you burn, so if you get a 100 horsepower engine, it makes 100 horsepower heat as well, which just oh. goes out your radiator and just disappears. Right. And you've got friction. But there's probably ways and means of getting a more efficient engine. And, I, and I also, I think the, the battery, battery cars, are miss, they're missing the plot somewhere on battery cars. Yeah, that's there's a good got, answer. There's got to be, a, there, is, there is and there will be a better way of generating the electricity. We just haven't found it yet. Yeah, and storing it. Yeah, I think the whole right. electric car thing, although the government is trying to sort of force us down that route and, and manufacturers well, and, motorbike, do that. Le- and electric motorbikes. They're getting True. better and they're getting better and better. I mean, they're going 190 or 200 mile an hour now, don't they? Just top speed. Yeah, they're quick. There's no doubt they're quick. But the range and cost is the, what's the killer for them, it's isn't the top, it? And, and also the worry, lithium arm between your legs, is people worry about like, me riding in shorts on a motorbike. You try riding a bike, it's got lithium ion in it. Once that well, goes... Indeed, mind you, I suppose petrol ain't that between your legs is a bit iffy as well, isn't it? But uh, yeah, but no, that just burns and it's gone out. But that te- Tesla car that caught fire in Switzerland took them two days to put it out. Yeah, that's not good, is it? Yeah, yeah, very days. good. Point. Yeah. So I, th- so I right. think yeah, that, that 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 needs to be that, that we haven't quite hit the spot with it yet. I think we're we're getting close, but we need that that there will be a massive sudden change in electric vehicles soon. I'm sure. Yeah, it seems. I think hydrogen seems to be the candidate, doesn't it? That's one way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. You need something you can top up quick. You need something you can go in, top up, and go off on your business. You don't yeah, have to wait this four hours. Yeah, that's just crazy. That's never going to fly, is it? But uh, interesting. So uh, we'll see what happens there. So thank you, Faraz, for that question. That's a good one. Uh, next one from uh, I think it's it could be the Vale Rider or Valley Rider, depending on whether he's a um, Valentino Rossi fan. Hi, Andy. Here's my question for Alan. What gives you the inspiration and ideas to build these wonder machines? I think we've sort of covered that, haven't we? It's, it, I see something or hear something go to a show, see something someone's done. Someone will say to me, oh, do you think you could do that? And, and it, it'll, Well, the Flying Milliard, for instance, I got given, the, I bought the cylinders on eBay because I went to um, Salon Privé with my SS100, which was the smallest bike I'd ever made, basically. And Steve Parrish was giving me out the award. And he said, what are you going to bring next year? Are you going to bring a bike? And I said, I'll make the biggest V-twin. Right. And that, so that was the inspiration. I'm making the biggest V-twin. Yeah. So I'm straight on eBay and I found these aeroplane cylinders, which were from the Motorcycle Museum in Birmingham. 
and, I, and that, so I ended up with these two pair of motorcycle like airplanes in so that was my inspiration and did you so, did you then show it to um parish oh yeah you've seen so it you, he, i won the following year with the bike oh fantastic <laughs> I, won, oh, I, won, winner. I won again what an yeah, absolute was, winner a lot, a lot of my bikes have won at salon pre bike it's good is, is very, he one very, of the judges he is, yes. Yeah, Henry Cole and Steve Parrish. And ah, well, Vicky so with Henry Henderson Cole, was... you've got a vested interest. And Steve, yeah, well, he's that, an yeah. aeroplane man as well. So uh, you're on to a he winner is. with that. <laughs> it, was Vicky Butler, it was Vicky Butler Henderson one year as well. She was one of the judges one year. Right, right. So, Excellent. Gosh, so, so it's, 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 it's a very, very posh event. But it's, it's not, it, well, it's pr I'm privileged to have been invited to display. You have to be invited to display. Wow, and, and then they and then they charge you for that for the privilege as well. So it's, what a great, what well, that's an amazing business model, isn't it? I love that sort of thing. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, you have to be you have to be invited, and you have to pay as well. So <laughs> great stuff. What a privilege. Nice one, yeah. Valley Rider. All right, next question from Alastair Winner. Great name. Uh, two questions. One, what is Alan's day job? So what would you regard that as? We well, you spend your time. I, I work. I work. I work for Henry a lot of the time. Yeah. I work for Classic Motorcycle Mechanics as a writer for my column. And I, and I do my YouTube videos now and I, and I fiddle with motorbikes. I don't take commissions, not normally, or, or make or repair people's bikes. It's usually close friends, but I'm flat out all day, basically. Yeah, it sounds like you've got more than enough to be getting on with. Uh, yeah, uh, I took my early retirement. I was, I was offered my early retirement when I was 50 from my previous job, so I had to jump yeah. with that. So. Now you can live and do the stuff you want to do, which is much better, yeah. idea, if you ask me. Um, next yeah. question from Alastair. What brand of motorcycle do you most admire for its engineering excellence? What a great question. It's very difficult, really, because I don't. <laughs> They're all right. You know what? This is not, no honest lie. I went to the motorcycle show at the NEC, and nothing inspired me to buy. Because I've got a 1991 Pan European that I ride most days, like we're going to head. I do 80 mile round trips on it every day. Yeah. But I, 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 I have not seen anything that jumps out to me as a bike to buy. Did you see that new, um, the new Ducati Street Fighter? Yeah, but you get wet. It's got no back guards. I know. I know. It's, it's got I... no back seat. I say, I'm not a screen. massive fan of that. I, it's, everyone discusses their colour of their screens. You know, they're at a bike meet. Yeah, come and see my TFT. It's really cool. It goes all different colours. Oh, yeah, don't get yeah, me started uh, on TFT. Oh, mine's well. got Bluetooth connectivity. And look at all my switches on my handlebars. I've got so many, I can't. I don't know what they yeah, all yeah, do. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. I, like I, like the raw, the raw, I like the raw feel of a proper motorbike. where You, you kickstart it. It makes a lot of noise. And, and you're riding the bike, not looking at what the thing can do to your telephone. You know? <laughs> exactly. Character is what it's all about, isn't it? They're very bland. I've ridden, I've ridden lots and lots of modern bikes, and I, I do find them very, very bland. Yeah, the more, the more I ride uh, modern bikes, and I ride quite a lot of them, obviously, with my reviews, but uh, I've also ridden a few older bikes recently, and I have to say I've yeah. so much enjoyed riding the older bikes. And it's, I've sort of come to the conclusion that actually it's the basic things about how a bike you know, sounds, smells, how it vibrates, yeah. accelerates. It's those basic things that really matter about whether you're going to get on a, a bike. Like you yeah. say, whether it's got, you know... X levels of traction control and the best TFT, that doesn't mean, ultimately, that doesn't mean anything, does it, in terms of your no. enjoyment of the bike? Um, too, I find that they're too powerful. The brakes are too good. Yeah. And the handling is too good. For 90% for of the people that ride them, because they've got all the stuff, they've got the Rossi leathers, and they're out on their R1. Yeah. But they might as well be on a GS1000, because they'll probably go faster on a GS1000, because you're yeah. sitting upright, you can go into the corners at legal speeds, and you can get around the corners quick. I've ridden yeah, bikes I, like that. Like that all the time, and you, I, I, for me, your clip ons are down like this. You can't see, you can't get your head up. It's Tell not, me about you know, you, it. The adventure you, bikes are probably better, but they're so big, they're so tall and quite heavy for most people. <laughs> I love that. They'll, they'll buy the Viper. <laughs> I bump, I, yeah, I bump into them all the time. I'm on trail riding on my old 1982 KDX, and the, the guy's got to have the 1200R BMW trail bike. Yeah. With all the sat nav and the big glass thing on the front and the boxes on the back, because he needs it, you know. Yeah, I'm not what sure you need that. is a, you need a TTR 125 is what you need. Yeah, the lighter the better. Go... If you're on the trails, you don't want one of them. Yeah. I've fallen off them enough to know that. <laughs> yeah, you're pinned Excellent. underneath it. You've got six people coming on to pick you up. You know. <laughs> yeah, you would tell me about that as well. It's happened recently. Anyway, unfortunately, oh, right, I was okay. rolling the camera at the time. Thank you anyway, right. Alistair, for that question. Great question. Not sure we answered it, but we had a good uh, marvel about it. Next one, AD Goldspink. Question for Alan. Is there a bike that Alan would never modify or use for a project and why? No, anything. Good answer. <laughs> because here's the reason, right? It's just metal. Yeah. If, if it's worth five million pounds and it's a one-off, if someone said to me, "Could you make it into a V twin?" If he's going to pay me to do it, or we work out a deal, I wouldn't hesitate because it's only metal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's only metal. 
But what about more modern bikes with all their complicated electronics and ECUs and stuff? Would you? you that, know, that's I... not a problem. That's not a problem. The problem with modern bikes is the, the castings are so thin because they've got the computerized um, methods of manufacturing now, so they can yeah. get everything as light as possible. So there's no tolerance for me to cut something and weld it and put, hold its shape. It'll just move all over the place. How interesting. Yeah, of course. That but is but not... I wouldn't say it's impossible. Yeah. But like, for instance, I get a lot of requests to make a V6 out of a trunk rocket. And yes, you could do it. It's totally possible. Yeah. But it, it would be a lot of, uh, I don't, it doesn't inspire me at all because it's a modern engine. It's been, they're, they're, they're sort of anemic modern engines. It, yeah. They're not, older engines look like, the Z1 engine is a lovely bike engine to look at, really, really nice engine. Because it's designed to be seen in the bike. Yes, yeah. A lot, but a lot of modern engines are anemic. And the just recent craze of having your naked bike, but the old engine is still an engine that's designed to go inside a fairing. Yeah. Like the fire blades and that. So you've got all the pipes and bits and bobs and stuff and they just look horrible. I completely get that. They do um, some of these. I do like custom bikes generally, but uh, some of the ones that you see the more, for want of a better term, amateurs doing it's like the first custom bike, whatever that has all those exposed pipe work. It just looks rubbish, yeah. doesn't it? And uh, yeah, doesn't... the sort of bike. It's one of the reasons. Go it's on. one of the reasons I use the Dodge Viper engine for my bike because the engine actually looks quite nice. It's got five exhausts at each side. It's, yeah. it's symmetrical on both sides. If you, cause I did look at the Aston Martin Vantage Bankash engine, the V12. Right. And it's not designed to be looked at from the side, only from the top when you're at the bonnet. Yeah. We can't see the top on a motorbike. She's got a petrol tank. Of course. And yeah. there's some chap in Germany has actually made a V12 bike using that engine, but it looks, in my opinion, it looks awful from the side. It's all belts and pulleys and bolts and brackets. Yeah. You know, see, it's, it doesn't work. But the Viper engine looks particularly clean and motorcycle-ish from the sides. Well, that's why, funnily yeah. enough, that's one of the things that I think Triumph have now latched onto, haven't they, with their new rocket, the current rocket. Um, three. Yeah. I mean, that engine looks quite nice. Well, from the one side where the exhaust come it, out, it looks the nice. The side it's always seen out, it looks nice yes. on, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But they've done a nice job of hiding all the, you know, pipe work and stuff on that. Um, they have. But again, well, when, that, of... when that first came out, my friend ran me, he goes, how long ago your bike is on the front page of my soccer news? He goes, what? Why are you running that story for again? I went, rushed out and bought it, and it was the rocket. <laughs> and I thought, my God, and it, from a quick glance in a news agent, it looked just like my Viper bike. They do have a passing resemblance, I have to say. Yeah, so yeah. I stuck a picture up on Facebook with the two pictures together, and I saw it was that, quite yeah. incredible the amount of response I got with that. That's they definitely copied right. you, no doubt about that. Thousand, I had about two and a half thousand likes, and people just commenting on it and everything. Brilliant. Uh, next question from AD Goldsmith again. Second question. Uh, this might be putting you on the spot. If you could choose one of my bikes for a project, which would it be and what would you do to it? So, and you're allowed to say you can stick it in a crusher. So I've got, <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a BMW GS, I've got a Triumph Speed Twin, a Royal Enfield Interceptor, Ducati Panigale, Triumph Street Triple and a Honda CRF. Which they all fit in that category of previous answer, don't they, really? Yeah, Friends. I thought you might say that. Okay, then we'll switch <laughs> <it in. laughs> why, would, why would you want to change something like that? It's just write it as it is because it does everything perfectly. Oh, good. Well done. You got out of that nicely. <laughs> it's true, though, isn't it? The Triumph Twin, that, the new Bonneville, it's a beautiful bike. Why would you want to cut it up and change it? That is true, actually. I must admit, that um, that Speed Twin I've got, <clears> which, which you've seen, was is a lovely bike. And... Um, it's smooth to ride, but for something that does look retro, I mean, it is thoroughly modern. It's a lovely bit of kit. I, I love that bike. Anyway, moving swiftly on then. Darren Shields. Um, ooh, he says, my question is, would Alan consider doing an A to Z course of motorcycle maintenance on his YouTube channel? Thanks. Well, I suppose I could. Well, what you, an idea, you, I videos, you can do that. Yeah, maybe. maybe. I'll, let's, let's say not. I won't say no. But I, could, I sort of have. Every time I do a video, I try and do a little bit of maintenance as well. But it's, yep. you know what's really hard though? Everyone's saying, oh, you didn't say put oil on the cam when I did the points. But I've already done that, but I didn't film it. You know, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't, I'm not, I need to get, gear myself up for thinking about everything in its simplest form if I'm going to do that. Because I'll do stuff without thinking about it that people cool. might think, oh, he's missed a massive chunk out here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like me, I, I, I put it, it's like me with computers. I'm, I'm terrible with computers like Macs and this sort of stuff. If something goes slightly wrong, I'm completely, oh my God, what do I do? Yeah. So I have to try and think. I have to try and think like I'm working with a computer, and other people are working with motorbikes, and get the same sort of feeling. Excellent. So, so it's hard. But yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll think about that. Not some, idea. I can't imagine you're going to run out of content anytime soon. But it'd certainly be another string to the channel, wouldn't it? It was. Uh, you'd certainly. Yeah, I, I could do. do a, you could make it chargeable. Okay. You'd make a fortune. I'm trying to do a how. I do a how it's made series at the moment. I've done a few of them. How it's made. Like the, I'm doing a particular job, like my son's XL 175 engine repair. I did. Yes. Well, I didn't just go out and buy parts. I just, it needed some rings. So I found some rings in the shed that offer different engine that, that I could machine to fit. Yeah. And, and it's bored out. So it's bigger CC. I just make a copper gasket for it and stuff like that. Yeah. And the amount of people that say, you be, you know, you've got a four valve piston. Yeah. It doesn't matter. As long as the piston doesn't hit the valves, 
the shape yeah. of the piston is irrelevant unless you're going for the last nth degree of horsepower, which we weren't. Yeah. It's, it's a BFR 750 with Kawasaki Z1000 rings in a Honda 175. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, if it works, why not? We've right. done thousands of miles on it. Thank you to Darren for that question. Next one from Paul Harris. Uh, Hi, Andy. Love watching Alan's YouTube videos and the precision of his work. He obviously didn't see the screws. Uh, no. Can you ask Alan, has anything gone horribly wrong with the build? Um, and it would make quite a funny <coughs> blooper video if you have. Not, well, not really. I don't know. It's Fair really enough. hard to say, to say that. If something happens, I, I never let it phase me. I just go round it. Like, yeah. say, for instance, you do file a little bit too much off. You just weld it back on and start again. Yeah, would you show that on the video? Like, yeah, I could do if it came to it. <laughs> yeah, I would. I think actually, if you, I'm, I'm known for making cock ups. I, I very rarely dabble with the spanners because it never works, ends well. Um, but if you do make a cop up, cock up, it makes for a better video, well, frankly. It does what in my I'm going to do is do, I'm, I might start doing outtakes because my last video, I did an outtake of me putting on some gloves and going like that. Mm. So many people told me off for not wearing gloves. It was yeah. on every other comment was, where's your gloves, where's your gloves, where's your gloves? It's getting boring now, boring, boring, boring. Where's yeah, your yeah, gloves? make sure you wear safety glasses and stuff, for goodness sake. So, so, so this time I went out on my SS100, I got my boots on, I got my leather jacket, and, and at the end I went like that and put my gloves on. And yeah. I've got people commenting on that now. So it's, Brilliant. So I'll, Actually, some, I think... I'll, some outtakes. I'll do some outtakes at the end of things that go wrong. It's funny how people <laughs> like that. I've just started putting a few outtakes on the end of mine, of which there are many. Um, yeah, and yeah. sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're not, but people seem to like watching them. So yeah, definitely worth, worth doing. Uh, I suppose ending up, ending up in hospital in, at two o'clock in the morning when something you're pressing apart slips out the press and takes <laughs> half your finger off. So yeah, I don't know. Once. I bet they yeah. get a lot of views if you have your finger sliced yeah. off. YouTube would probably ban it. 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah, but it was true. I ended up in hospital with stitches in my finger. Ooh. Is that, the, is that I, the worst accident you've had of that nature? Yeah, possibly. I, I, I tend not to have accidents because you can't, can you? If you have an accident, you can't do any work. Yeah. But I was pressing something out on my press, and there's it a, a length to weight height ratio of, of the cylinder. I, I know all about this. Yeah. It's one of those situations that's late, you want to get the job done, you pick something up, this is a bit tall for its diameter, we'll give it a go anyway. Right. I got up to about five or six tons, and the bar just literally bent and spat out. Oh. And what did I do? I tried to catch it. Oh. I didn't want to hit one of my bikes, so I tried to catch it, and it like that on my finger, and it split my finger completely open. Yeah. <clears throat> so I had to no. go to hospital. I, I drove myself into hospital yeah. in my old Series 2A, Series 2A Land Rover I had at the time. And then I took yes. a couple of stitches and tetanus injection and all that sort of stuff. I, I, I had a similar accident when making a chicken curry once. <laughs> I, <laughs> I had a knife that was too blunt and I chopped the top of my finger off and, and again yeah. drove myself to hospital. But the blood yeah. just wouldn't stop. So, but, and yeah. I, had, I had masses of bandages on my hand to try and drive. I felt a bit queasy as well. And I got yeah. to the hospital and it looked like a butcher's shop in my car. It was at blood everywhere. Everywhere. And, uh, and when I got to the A&E place, I took this uh, bandage off and it just the blood sort of squirted out the top of my finger. And there, uh, I was very quickly seen to. It was great. Anyway, that's another yeah. story. <laughs> We've yeah. all done it. Uh, although my circumstances were slightly different. Next one from David Bulchholz. I hope I've got your name right there, David. Uh, Andy, is there a bike that Alan would definitely not take on as a project and why? No. If it's, if it's a motorcycle and, and I, I'm inspired to do it and it's Thank available, you. I'd do it. I, I've done also. I've made a Lambretta twin once for a chap who wanted one for a skeeter. Brilliant. And I'm not really into skeeters, but I, I used to have Lambrettas when I was a kid, so I know the engine inside out. And I actually put a send on a Lambretta for somebody. I've had a Voss Vos Squad 175 I've done some work on. Yep. That's a Russian motorcycle. So, it. No, anything. If, if, it, if it works and it's a motorcycle, it can be fixed and modified. I like the idea of a four cylinder boxer engine. Just throwing that out there <laughs> for <Yeah>. my GS. <laughs> With, you could imagine some cylinders poking front and back as well as out the side, like a cross. That'd be I, I have seen one where someone's bent them up, and that looks really nice. So it's like a bead halfway between a motor, like a motor guzzy, but not quite right. as far. Give them more ground clearance in the corners. Yeah, yeah. I suppose, actually, if you did the cross thing, like I said, you'd end up with like a radial engine, wouldn't you, effectively? It's the same difference, isn't it? Yeah, you, you could you have them like that, you could, yeah. 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 Do you have a favourite configuration of engine that you like to work on? Oh, I'm not really, no. It's the same thing again, whichever one I'm working on. Fair I do enough. like the straight sixes. I must say they sound nice, the straight sixes, but they're a bit wide. B yeah. twins are cool. The singles yeah. are cool. They're all cool, aren't I've they? Got, I've got a little Yamaha 100 twin from 1967 that's actually standard, and it's lovely. It's a real buzz box to ride, you know? Fabulous, fabulous. Excellent. Right, thank you, David, for that question. Next one uh, from Philip Kirk. Uh, could be a couple of questions here. Hi, Andy. Question for Alan. Following on from the Atco lawnmower video, the one we talked about earlier, uh, have you got any plans to do custom engines for any of your garden machinery? <laughs> Inline well, full mower or V-twin hedge cutter, etc. 
No, well, the Atco, I've actually got a spare engine for it, and I did really? loosely say I could, I could actually make it into a nice, proper 1920s V twin, and I'd make it so you couldn't tell. But yeah. um, if I get nothing else to do for a couple of weeks, one day maybe I'll do it. You know, but for now it just stays as it is. Knock that out one spare Sunday afternoon. It, w- it wouldn't take long. It'd be, it'd be a week's work. But, wow, but, that, uh, the mind boggles that you can possibly do that. It would take me a year to plan it, a year to mess it up, and then uh, a year of regret as I tried to get rid of the spares. Uh, right, <laughs> second question from Philip, um, slightly more serious. He said, would you consider taking his hacksaw to a, oh, actually, we talked about this earlier, to a modern bike engine like a Speed Twin to create a special? It would get very expensive, I know. Well, it was not so much the expense. It's that you, you've got a bland engine to start with. What, I can't, I'm not inspired with that engine. If it, yeah. if it was something I could see a possible improvement to make it look cool, like a factory bike, I'd do it. The yeah. modern engines are hard anyway, because like I said before, they've been designed on computers and they're, they're absolute minimalistic amount of metal. And the metal wraps itself around the internal components if you look at an engine modern. Yeah, engine. good. But I'd never thought of that before. That's a good point. You've got, you've got gear inside. You can see the casing is mold because they do it on computers with solid, solid works computers. Yeah. So it's solid uh, CAD CAM packages, you know, and it's downloaded straight into a CNC machine and, and um, yeah. free rapid prototyping. It's all cool stuff. But it doesn't lend itself to what I do with bikes, really. So. so is there a period when engines kind of swapped over? So would you say it's like pre-1985, you're fine, after that, oh, don't touch? The, um, the Yamaha was 96, and that's fine. Oh. My RC374 is it's the 90s, <clears throat> and that's perfectly okay. Right. Excellent. Right, next question. So thank you to uh, Philip for that. Next one from Roger Middleton. Uh, I think we've covered this a bit, but do you design your products on the back of a fag packet? <laughs> or, or I think it's even less than that. Or is there a more detailed approach going on in the background? No, I very rarely do any drawings at all. They're not even sketches. I just see, I just, <coughs> excuse me. I get on the lane, just start machining stuff with no drawings because I just, just machine it to, to my vision. I love that about you, that it's not even back a fag packet. That doesn't no. even come into it. It's just I, use my phone, I, I use my phone to Google stuff quite a lot. Like, for instance, tapping drill sizes and stuff that I've forgotten. I just Google it. Yeah. What or do or the thread depth for an M6 thread. You know, you use it 0.7 or 0.6. I just Google it quick. Brilliant. But I don't do any drawings. I love that. Gosh, again, the mind boggles. Next question. So thank you, Roger, for that question. Bill Kerr, <laughs> he says, uh, given the precision required in engines, what measurement and design tools does Alan use when re-engineering an engine? Alan and his son have been mentioned in the bicycle... Oh, there's an, that's another question. We'll come back to that in a second. So, yeah. So the first one, <coughs> given the precision required in engines, what measurement and design tools do you use? Well, all the standard things, really. Micrometers, dial gauges. Yep. I've got... There's a dial gauge here, look. So these the must have... use, yeah, use one of these if you're things up. It's just the needle moves. Excellent. Micrometers for measuring the thicknesses, slip gauges. And and a lot get... of it's done by feel. A lot of it I do by feel because you don't need to measure it. You can just, it's just the feel of how things fit together. I mean, I noticed in a lot of your recent videos, you've, you've used your lathe, for example, just to like, I don't know, find the center of a bit of bar or something or, or doing yeah. stuff that isn't actually turning. So would you, would yeah. you um, say things like a lathe is indispensable? I mean, would oh, you have... 100 I could, I need, you need a lathe, a bare minimum of tooling to do what right. I do. You need a lathe because you can use a lathe for doing milling on the lathe. You can yep. do flat surfaces as well as round surfaces. Yeah. I use it for setting up crankshafts from the centers. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's that's what I should be doing originally, didn't I? Yeah, 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 yeah. Setting up the crankshafts. You don't, because you can have a crankshaft setting up, Jude, but just use the lathe. I haven't yeah. got much space, so I try and use one tool to do lots of jobs rather than have the tool for every job. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. So, <clears> so that was the measurement. Uh, so design tools was the other thing. I mean, there's not really design tools, are there? It's your head, it's your brain. It's my head. I just see everything I need to do. Brilliant. Excellent. Next question design, from but... Bill then. Uh, Alan and his son have been mentioned in the bicycle press recently. Is he hoping <clears> or planning to go into commercial production? I'm not, but it might be. Oh, excellent. That's that. We have to wait and see on that, on that case. Brilliant. So we have, we have been approached by a few manufacturers, but we'll have to wait and see. Fantastic. So, so for anyone that didn't see your video, this is the, the shaft driven um, ahead of its time. Now, well, that mountain bike was 10 years ahead of its time 15 years ago. Yeah. And it's still ahead of its time now. And we, we, it was it's internal drive, eight-speed gearbox. And you, <clears throat> the beauty of it is you can shift gear when you're pedaling, when you're coasting, when you're pedaling backwards. Or when you crash and you're in top, you can go straight to first without having to pedal. So it's I can't imagine how that possibly works. One day, perhaps you can do a video on the, how that works. As when I watched well, your, I, I, that recent yeah, thing that you did about that, it has I, got, it has got okay. chains. They're just inside the middle of the frame rather than on the outside of the frame. 
Right. Because if they're on the outside of the frame, they get damaged. Like, like Stephen bought a new bike just recently, and he literally just riding it along in the car park where he's going riding, and the derailleur snapped off. Because oh, the right. hanger, he knocked yep. the hanger in his van or something, and, it, and it's, that's it. That's his day's riding gone. Yeah, yeah. And that's 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 the reason I made that bike back in two thousand eight. Because I was taking my son racing, and we were spending a hundred quid a week on derailleurs. Oh, crikey! <laughs> Every time he'd ride it, he'd break the derailleur or the hanger or the gears. So I thought this is archaic. Designed in nineteen twenty, and we're still yeah. using it today. Yeah, well, so, I, well, you get a tiny bit of extra weight, but you get a hundred percent more reliability. So we could Sorry. we could yet see more from the Milliard push bike. Yeah, maybe. We'll, we'll, we'll see how it all goes. Excellent. And uh, Bill's last question, I think, again, we've touched on this, and I don't know what, what, whether he's got something in mind. Does Alan take commissions to build specific motorcycles? No. I'm sure the reason for that is I haven't got the time. And in space, if I, if I had a larger premises with space, I could take jobs on and I could park them and I can come and work on them and eat it. Yeah. But I, I, it's, it's like a Chinese puzzle most days here getting bikes moving stuff around so i can work on something yeah so i haven't got the space but the trouble is if i i find it hard saying no so i have to say no because otherwise i'll say yes and i'll, and I'll end up doing it and causing myself loads of hassle yeah I'm actually so be quite I, I do it for friends I, I i do some work for friends i look after a few bikes for friends yeah but great stuff. i get so many messages on instagram and messenger about doing work on bikes so but don't bother is the is the so don't don't I send a message. Well, they, can, they can they can send me a message. I'll just reply saying not 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 now. But if it changes in the future, I'll maybe yes, you know. Fair enough. Fair See enough. it like that. <clears throat> All right. Next question from Philip Kirk, uh, Captain Kirk's son, I assume. Um, hi Andy, a question forwarded from my dad. Oh. Uh, I do wonder if he has a day job. This will be you. Uh, yeah. as some of these creations <clears throat> take a huge amount of time, or does Alan sell one to finance the next? Well, they don't take a huge amount of time. That's, the Vela set was eight weeks from scratch, from the very first cut to a finished bike that rides. It was eight weeks. Unbelievable. That's just incredible. And that's not working on it all the time. I, I do other stuff as well. I mean, I'm filming with Henry three days a week. Yeah. I just, you must be very rapid. I just, I, what it is, because I don't do any, I don't sit around pondering things. I know exactly what I'm going to do. So I go, yeah. out, I go out in the garage for an hour, I can do a day's work for, probably. Yeah. Because I know exactly what I'm going to do. I just get on with it and do it. Brilliant. So, so that is my day job. Yeah, yeah, indeed. We sort of spoke about that earlier, so that's great. Thank you, Philip, for the question. Next one from... We're getting through this. Let's just see how many... We'll, oh, actually, uh, only got a couple more. How are we doing for time? Blimey, we've been on over an hour, would you believe? Uh, next yeah. one, Nick Turnbull. Uh, my question to Alan is, why are some of his fantastic creations in the Barber Museum in the States rather than here? I'd love to be able to go and see them. Maybe that's a good excuse to go on a tour of the States when this virus thing is over. Do that. It's the biggest museum in the world. The wow. biggest and most prestigious museum in the world. And I'll just say to anyone, try and get a bike in the Barber Museum. It's really hard. I was, but I was invited. Wow. They, they purchased them from me. They, they, they have to purchase them. Yep. But um, they wanted four of my bikes. So I got the V8, the V12, my very first five, my very first SS100 V20. And in its own little corner in the Barber Museum. It's, it's just, well, I'm, I'm privileged, really. Amazing. So was that the reason that you, that you sold them? That it was just the yeah. Well, they they rang me up and they said we've got we've got a chap in the country who wants to look at your V8. And I said, well, it's not for sale. Yeah. But if you want to come and have a look at it, if you want, and they offered me the right amount of money and the deal was done. And it <laughs> and went. Sell for the right amount. They bring it to the right price, isn't it? And back in the yeah. day, it was a very useful amount of money and it helped yeah. at the time. You know? So that went. The V12 went, and then the yeah. five cylinder went, and the V8 S100 went. Wow. And they did. And I, I I regularly get a phone call from them. Right. Saying you know bike the particular bike but i've not sold anything since so oh they still after more stuff are they well i don't know if, i don't know if they're after stuff but we keep in contact right we, we never know Facebook and stuff. So right. I, I, I need to go and see them myself they've been out since 2004 that was my next <laughs> question was whether whether you've been over and seen them because that would be amazing i, I feel like what i was planning to go this year yeah i was actually planning i hadn't bought my ticket but i was on the very edge of the getting my ticket just as the coronavirus kicked in I'll tell you I what, won't be going this year. I think that'd be a great little feature for the motorbike show. You should speak to Henry. <laughs> Maybe a paper yeah, well, ticket. We, I, I need to get out there because they, they like, I'll still have to just do a talk about my bikes or something while I'm there. I'm quite happy to do that. Yeah, oh, wow. That'd be, be amazing, wouldn't it? You know, be interesting. Cause I can walk around the bike with people and I can tell them stuff that no one knows about yeah. bikes. Yeah, so fabulous. I've got, all the, I've got 2,000 photographs as well I can take with me. Right, it so, could be a long talk then. Well, yeah, I can show people how, how it's because back, back when I made the V8, I did everything by hand. I didn't have a milling machine or anything. I, an old model maker's way. It's not, not even the big layer I've got now. Yeah. And I did everything by hand with files and hacksaws. Incredible. Wow. 
Amazing stuff. So uh, where is the Barber Museum in the States? So when, if I get over there on a bike, which way do I need to go? Oh, my batteries just run out. Um, Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, right. OK. So that's south, isn't it? So if I'm you're not doing quite sure. It's Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. If you're doing this southern states, then that's one to do. Hmm. Yeah. It's worth going. So it's, it, apparently you need four days to look around it. It's huge. Wow. And, and is it just bikes? No, they've got cars in there as well. Racing cars and stuff. Right. So it's petrol head's dream. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just go. They've got a good website. We'll look on the website. Yeah, I'll Google Barber it. Barber Vintage Motorsport Museum. Excellent. Right. We've got uh, two more questions. So first one from, uh, might be three questions, but from Ian. Uh, question for Alan. He seems to have done a lot of Kawasaki bikes. Just wondering if there's a, if there's a reason for that. Is he a Kawasaki <coughs> fanboy? No, not really. I got given one back in 1996. <laughs> I was given a KH250, all in bits. It's a complete decrepit wreck of a bike. Yep. Yep. And I was looking at it. I was going to restore it, but the cost to restore it was astronomical. And I thought I was just going to do a quick blow over on it and use it as a hack. Yeah. When I was looking at the engine, I could see where the engineers had converted it from a twin to a triple back in the day in the Kawasaki factory. And I thought, oh, I'll just make it into a five. So that was my very first five. And then obviously, then there's the KH400 I made into five, and the 500, the 750, then I made a 1300 five. And it just, so, I just stuck with Kawasaki's, really. So, so it is true that you've done more with Kawasaki's than other bikes, is it? Yeah, I've made it, I've, I've converted all the Zs yep. into V8, Speed 12, and now Straight 6. And the triples into every configuration, basically. Fabulous. Uh, have five. Kawasaki been in touch at all about taking some No, it's old school, isn't it? It's, this is old stuff. They're not interested in that. Yeah, well, I don't know. As a, as a piece in their reception, I would have thought that would have worked quite yeah. well. Yeah, the, the Super 6 is probably the nicest one I've made, I think. Yeah, yeah. But for original looking. Yep. The V8, the V8 was, there was a couple of areas on the V8 that's not 100% to my liking, but I couldn't get around it. I bet the um, uh, V8 sounds amazing, doesn't it? It sounds like a small box Chevy. Oh, yeah, cruise all day, all day at 85. It just sits there in the middle lane following all the reps in the cars. Great stuff. It's an amazing thing to ride. I did really 4,000 miles on it. So what, what sort of problems did you have with that that you couldn't get around then? I find that amazing. Oh, no, no. It's fitting the carburetors in. I right. had no space. I, did get, I had to cut the carbs in half. Right. Wow. Because they were too big. So I cut them in half and shrunk them down and made new slides. Right. I think to, you did get to around get, then. To fit. If you look at a straight, straight on side picture, you'll see it. Right, right. And it only just fits. So I very, very, like, the inlet manifold was marginal. It could, do, could have been done with being a bit better. Then it wouldn't look right. Right. So right. I, as, a com as a compromise, you know, but it, I did the best I could really at the time. Well, got round it by the sounds of it. So that was great. Okay. And then the last question from James uh, Weber. Um, has Alan, I think, again, we might have covered this. Has Alan ever started a project he couldn't finish? No, I've finished everything. Excellent. I, I always finish engines. Marvellous. So um, how many projects have you got on the go at the moment? Do you do one after the other or have you got a number on? No, I'm, I'm, I'm catching up at the moment. I'm, I'm making the second Super 6, Yep. which is going to be a 1,522cc engine based on the Z1000 rather than the Z900. Wow. Yeah. And I, I've actually been going around in lockdown. I've been catching up on all my other bikes that haven't been ridden for a couple of years, doing general battery charging and cleaning now, carburetors. I was wondering how you keep them all sort of roadworthy, basically. Do you just start them up and run them and heat them up? Or do you actually... No, it's the worst thing you can do. It's the absolute worst thing you can do is start an engine and just run it. Because it fills up everything with basically sulfuric acid. Because your engine produces some dilute sulfuric acid when it runs. Right. It's all inside your engine and your exhaust. I don't touch them. I basically, if I start an engine, the bike gets ridden for five miles. Right, okay. So and I'm really I mean, strict with that. Uh, so obviously the batteries could be flat. So if you don't, so how? Trickle the, charge. Oh, okay. Trickle are they all charge. on chargers? Are they? Yeah, they are, I just I rotate them around. I, I've, I've only bought two. They're expensive as chargers. So I just buy two, and I just um, one month on, one month off, basically. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but what I've got there's all the different theories, and different people have different ways. But I find with mine, I always use super unleaded fuel. Yep. On the old classics, I never use um, unleaded. It's got less right. ethanol in it. Yeah. And I just go around turn the I turn the petrol on every week just for five minutes, and then turn it off again. Keep right. the carburetors full of fuel, because what happens? The fuel gently evaporates away, and you uh, get okay. residues that blocks the jets. So right. you can either drain them completely dry, yep. but that in, that in itself has problems because it dries out seals, dries out rubbers. Yeah. So I think right, I'll keep them wet because they're designed to be wet. Yeah. So I always just turn the fuel on, wait for five minutes, turn the fuel off, and I do that about once, once or twice a month. And I've, and I've been doing it for years, and so every time I want to ride my bikes, they always work. Obviously works, yeah, brilliant, excellent. But for me, it works great. I, I'm not recommending it as everyone should do that, but well, it's what I do, and, and I find it effective. You know, so that's what I do. And my son does it as well on his bikes, and he's never had problems with jets blocking. 
Brill, that's obviously the way to go. I've got no, would you believe, none of my bikes have carburetors, so... Uh, no, well, fuel injection's brilliant. You, you, you don't have to think about anything. It just works. It's yeah, designed it's to run on ethanol. <laughs> yeah, you just turn the key and it always works. It builds up the pressure, and the pressure's so high, it blows, yeah. blows through and clears everything out. So. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I do have the same issue with batteries, though. I'm always having to keep mine... I, have, I again, have a couple of chargers that I rotate, but... Uh, well, having what said I've that, been doing... I mean, if you buy can... more expensive, if you buy more expensive batteries, I buy um, Odyssey batteries, pure lead ones. Right. The one I bought in the Viper is coming up ten years old now, and it still starts it instantly. Crikey! Oh, so I got that on the FM on the Viper and a couple of other bikes. So, but they are a, a standard battery for bike is like forty quid. They're one hundred and forty quid. So they're slightly more money. Sure. But they but they, they they don't discharge over the month. You can leave them for six months and they won't discharge. I know they've got a particularly high amp crankage or whatever have, the term is. They have. It's for the same size engines. of battery. It's right. nearly double for the same size of battery. Right, because they... So, quite, you, know, you pay, you make, there's, there's quite a few companies making them, but, but um, that, I use Odyssey batteries in my bikes, and they, I'm not sponsored by Odyssey, but should right, be. Well, you should be now. Yeah, you never yeah, know. Well, I, got, I bought one for my truck. I've got a Dodge Ram truck, and I bought it for that as well, and it absolutely just spins the engine over so fast. It's unbelievable. There must be some work you can do on the Dodge Ram that was a, well, I want to put a Viper engine in it, is what I really want to see, but you can't yeah. get the Viper engine My Viper engine, you won't pick a Viper engine up for a few thousand pounds now. Yeah, yeah. That trouble is you'd have to destroy your bike to do that, so that'd be a bit of a shame, wouldn't it? I would. That's, that is a Gen 2 mm. Viper engine. It's got um, magnesium parts. It's designed by Lamborghini in Italy. Wow. That's quite something Chrysler, for an American engine, isn't it? Chrysler sent a bus engine over to Lamborghini and said, make it into a sports car engine. <laughs> and and that's, that's the model I've got. Wow. Great stuff. Anyway, I'm out of questions now, Alan. So that was brilliant. Thank you for your time. We've been rattling on for about an hour and a half, would you believe? Uh, so uh, great to see you again. Okay. I can't, I can't wait for the uh, lockdown to finish so I can get on the back of that Viper, but let's hope it's a dry day. <laughs> no problem. All right, Andy. And congratulations with the YouTube channel. That, uh, I'm really yes. enjoying watching it. So anyone that hasn't watched Alan's YouTube channel, it's Alan Milliard, spelt with E-N on the end of Alan, if that makes sense. That's it. Um, and look forward to seeing you on the bike show as well. Okay. Nice to see you. Thank you, Alan. Great stuff. Yeah. Okay, so there we have it. That's my uh, chat with the amazing, fascinating Alan Milliard. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed making it. Sorry it went on for so long, but uh, what an interesting chap to talk to. Uh, must just give a huge thumbs up and massive thank you to my patrons and channel members for sending in those questions. Do stay tuned because I'll be having another one of these uh, questions y interview -y type things coming along soon with another amazing guest who I'm really happy to get on the uh, channel. So uh, stay tuned for that. If you haven't done so already, do hit that subscribe button. That way you won't miss that next video. All right, that's it for now. Look forward to speaking to you again soon. Until then, this has been the Missing and Fly. Cheerio. So there we are. That's uh, my chat with Alan Milieu. Let's do that again. I've no idea how you finished this. <laughs> that was great. I think you just touched uh, the screen on it.